start um, by asking a couple of questions. Um, you started your talk by discussing some of the skills required uh, for individuals to be successful in this crazy business. Um, and, you know, it's almost a trite observation now to say that this is a people business, but it is, and we know that. How difficult is it to find people who have the composite of the skills you mentioned? Um, if it is difficult, then A, how do we attract those people to the industry, or B, develop them internally? Well, the, tru the truth is, of course, that we're all fishing in the same pond. And that's the, ridic that's the ridiculous thing. You know, I, uh, talking to Guy Taylor, who runs our business in this region, and we're talking about various candidates for jobs at the moment, and we start saying to ourselves, well, this is a good man because he works for Agency X or Agency Y. But what, why isn't he getting on in his own agency? What we're going to do is to pay this man more money, or woman, more money. And when you get down to the economics of it, I've got to sell him for more money. So what's happening is that the people who are most mobile are actually going up the, up the ladder and we're selling them for more and more money, whereas they should have been much lower down the ladder, kept staying where they were 10 years ago. That's why I think you've got to go outside the pool. And this is not a very difficult industry. Most of the work that we do isn't, isn't uh, brain surgery. And what you need to have are people around you who really are professional men and women who understand how business works. And if you can do that, by going outside the pool, you can bring people in, you can train them. For example, we've just uh, developing an um, online university for all our staff, everybody. So you can, for example, you can go online, we'll have this up and running, this particular thing up and running later this year. You can do an MBA in what we call the Huntsworth University. You'll be able to do the MBA uh, online. If you're currently working in consumer goods, you can go on a course which will teach you how to do financial PR. You can go on and learn how to read a balance sheet. It's a continuous training campaign for all that you do. And where I sit, that's what you have to do. You have to go outside the pool, find really capable people, and then you train them up in communications so they're able to be good enough to liaise with the clients. But the thing that I absolutely insist on you all remembering is that when I go into a client's boardroom, I feel that he thinks Peter's been there before and he has the confidence to put forward his point of view. And the number of quite good PR people who we have employed over the years once they get into the boardroom just are incompetent. They're incompetent. And the client turns around and says to me, you know, I want you in here, guys, but unless it's you or it's Tim Bell or it's whoever it may be, it, it, it doesn't work. So we've got to bring on those people. Mm. Excellent. So important to look outside the industry as much as internally. Um, you talked about the advertising industry, its moves to buy digital agencies, and you talked about the need for the PR industry to own digital, um, and about how ideally suited the PR industry is in this age of content. I would put it to you, perhaps, that there's quite a big threat from some of the other marketing disciplines sure. as far as public relations is concerned. Increasingly, we all play on the same turf, the digital turf. And I think there are many, many clients, who knows, maybe outnumbering clients that buy PR, there are many clients who I think are looking to buy advertising agencies to provide them with their digital services. How? How worried are you about that situation? Oh, I think it's far, 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 far worse than that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, this is, this is a real threat. I mean, I, I think when I gave you my eight points, um, if you're not digitally, if it's not part of your DNA, if it's not really in your heart, then we're not going to win this battle. And losing this battle means the end of the industry. I mean, I say to my colleagues, I, I'm saying it to Guy at lunchtime today, if we don't improve in some of these digital areas, we will look over our shoulder and find the business has disappeared. It's gone. I mean, no, no client really thinks that because you were the new issues editor of the Times makes you into a good public relations person anymore. Uh, so, and and it's, it's certainly true that the advertising uh, industry is taking over the digital space. I, I think what's going to happen is that in five years' time, if we have not grasped the digital challenge 
absolutely in both hands, we will turn around and find that our lunch has been eaten by other people. So it's to me the, the reason that f the future will happen at all, essential. I did say in my words that if you don't pass the digital test, you're in the wrong industry. Thank you. Um, in the interest of time, I think we will take a couple of questions from the audience before we invite our distinguished panelists up onto the stage. Do we have any questions from the audience? Yep, there's a gentleman. I think they're going to bring you a, I think sorry, going to bring you a mic microphone. Um, so. And could you please in introduce yourself? Thank you. Sorry, hi. Stephen King from East Side again. Um, you mentioned being board competent. How do you train people to become board competent, or how do you train yourself to be at that level? Because it's such a niche uh, level of experience and access. Well, it's a very, very good point. I think it comes, it's a very difficult line. I mean, people who think that I'm arrogant, of which there are a large number, think that I'm arrogant, is when you step over a line from being confident to being self-opinionated. And it's a very hard thing to be confident can only come from you feeling certain that the advice you're giving is sound. That's why I said to you that being confident in giving advice, if the client can show you that you're wrong, it takes a certain amount of personal um, strength to say, yes, I got that wrong, you're quite right. I should, we shouldn't do it that way. You're perfectly right. And I think that only comes through experience. I just think it comes through experience. We're doing a, a fair bit of role model work at the moment. This is working quite well, putting young people into circumstances where they're meeting, going into the client boardroom, simulated client boardroom, and trying to get them to get that feeling. We don't find that problem with the people who haven't come up through the PR strain. If you've been a working at the White House, I've just been in... Uh, Qatar with the head of our education uh, division doing a presentation there and you know he he's worked with the president I mean nothing's going to face him I mean he's he's relaxed and you can feel it my wife met him and talked to him and you know feel good he's got plenty of experience feels good and that's where that's where we're getting our strength from we're getting our strength from people who are not in the traditional area of public relations and they're bringing that skill so it's a question of of What's your personality like, confident, arrogant? Doing some internal training and drawing your people from outside the historic public relations role. Interesting. Um, we have there's a gentleman more. down there. Yeah, there's a gentleman there. We'll take one more question before I, before I invite the panelists. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Yomi Badichokshaya and I'm the Secretary General of the African Public Relations Association. Um, this has been said here before, and that's the fact that we don't have the right people. We're not drawing from the right stream. Uh, and it happens, what I call it, it's like in a football team, we're playing with the fifth team. And we're trying to win the Premier League. And it's such a difficult task. Um, Sorry, this is just a, by way of a comment. There are many people who I believe are in public relations. They got on a bus and they're going to some other profession and stopped at a bus stop that had public relations on it. And they've just never gotten back onto the bus to where they're going. So they're playing footsie with this business. How do we make sure we see and we get the best so that we can produce the best? Thank you. Well... I think it's the only important question. Um, and I hope we get a chance to debate it a bit more. The people who are in the f fifth division are not going to win except purely by chance. They're not going to win a Premier League game. You're not even going to be able to train them up to be able to play in the Premier League. It's not a question of training. It's a question of all the eight points that I keep on banging on about. 
And I think there are two or three ways that one does it. The first is that there were, without any question, very good quality people coming out of the public relations schools in universities. But I don't want them. I want them to go and get a proper job in business or in healthcare or whatever it is who can come into me and I'll help them with their PR skills. That's the other way around. I don't want to do it the other way around. Uh, that seems to me to be an essential part. We've just, my wife and I have a, fa a family friend whose daughter just did very well at Oxford University, worked in, in um, medicine and worked biology and worked with us in Huntsworth Health for a year. Exceptional quality person. That's what I want. I want people who have done something different and been very successful at it that I can build the other skills around. That's the only way I think we can do it. The second thing I would say is I do believe, as I tried to answer the gentleman before, I do believe we have been recalcitrant in developing training schemes and helping people. We toss people into their jobs. We don't work with them, give them on-job training, anything like to the degree that we should. And thirdly, I actually think you have to assume that the people who are working, who go into merchant banks or go into um, accounting professions or management consultancy, I'm sorry, but we've got to make the public relations industry attractive enough to make this an alternative. And that means spending more money. If you look at the public relations salaries that we pay across the whole of the world, and you compare them with what are 35 years of age, and you look at what 35-year-olds are getting in banking, which are you going to go and do? If you're any good at all, you're not going to PR. We've got to get the whole scale of the thing up. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head there. At this point, um, I would like to invite our panelists up uh, for the remainder of the discussion, in no particular order then. And if you could please show your, your appreciation as they uh, take the stage. Uh, Ho Kim, founder and head coach of the Lab H. Um, Ho has 14 years of experience providing strategic communications counsel, previously ran Edelman Career, and will bring, I hope, a uniquely Asian perspective to this discussion. Um, next up, I'd like to invite Richard Linning, who is the immediate past president of the International Public Relations Association. Richard is something of a specialist in multinational, multidimensional corporate reputation and corruption issues across the EU, the Middle East, Russia, many countries, uh, and I think will also bring uh, a very interesting view. Next, I'd like to invite Chris McLaughlin, who is Vice President at Inmarsat PLC. Uh, we we talk often in this industry um, about how great it would be if we had clients who were high up enough that they could champion public relations. I think it's safe to say that Chris is one of those. He is a member of the executive management board at Inmarsat, of the strategy development group, and of the business development group. So I think he has plenty of work to do. Um, it's also worth noting he's the industry representative on two government committees, and he has held senior comms roles at Visa Europe, at Philip Morris, at BSB, and at the BBC Worldwide. Next up is Mohammed Alayed, founder and chief executive officer of Trans Arabian Creative Communications, perhaps better known as Trax. Mohammed is, of course, the founder of one of the fastest growing public relations consultancies in this region. Indeed, Trax was recognized in 2011 as the Homes Report's Middle East Consultancy of the Year. Gentlemen, thank you all for joining us. Um, yeah, okay, good. We've got everyone. I'd like to start, perhaps, Mohammed, by asking you, because I'm aware that you have some views on how you think this discussion should be framed in terms of how the role of public relations professionals is going to develop over the next 10 years. I think you have a couple of slides to show us. Is that true? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Just before I begin my slides, uh, I think uh, we've, had, we've had two days of engaging discussions. I want to just thank the organizers and everybody that 
had a part, big or small, to do with this Congress, which has been a great experience. Um, I, I'm pretty much going to say some things that I'm going to say are uh, pretty much in part with what Lord Chadwick has said earlier. Um, but I'd like to talk from a different perspective, which is clarity. See, we've been asked to talk about public relations in the next 10 years. So, you know, it would have been easy if I was manufacturing cars, would have given you a concept. So in 2022, this is what the car would look like. But um, in our business, we're pretty much going to be doing the same thing that we're doing best, which is managing the reputation image of a company or organization or government, etc. So I believe that, uh, that the main, main thing that we need to look at for the next 10 years is the whole clarity of the whole public relations to different stakeholders. So next slide, please. And to demonstrate this, I want to share with you something that we call the seeker, I call the seeker and provider matrix, which is basic, basically, there's three types of seekers. There's ones that want the service, there's ones that want the value, so they kind of see that the value of PR that brings into the whole mix. And then I, the other ones that we I'd call, it, I'd call them big picture seekers. These people are what exactly our keynote speaker talked about, the ones that bring the PR into the boardroom. On, this, by the other, on the other hand, there's three people or three different groups that provide, uh, that do provide the service. So for example, you have practitioners, and you have specialists, and then you have strategists. <coughs> and if we compare public relations to medicine, you have a GP, a general practitioner, that comes in and you know, does all, everything, and then you have somebody who's a specialist in some kind of a, a disease or, or a discipline, and then you have a person who's like board certified, and he's a professor. Next slide, please. So this causes us a big dilemma. First of all, where are we from this whole mix? Are most of the people we work for are looking for the service? And are most people providing the service are practitioners? Because it will not work in 10 years if we are not working with big picture people and providing a strategic service. It's not going to work. It's going to be the same old story like 10 years and 15 years ago. So this, my opening remarks on this, one, on this special, specific issue is that there needs to be much more, much more focus on the big strategic issues, especially in our part of the region where PR is, uh, is, is a newcomer compared to other countries in the world. So, and it's developing very fast and there's a lot of changes. Next slide, please. So I believe that there's three things that have to happen. PR to different stakeholders, whether seekers or providers, has to be much more clarified and much more defined. In a lot of respect, it has to be more refined. And to add to the dilemma, it must be unconfined. Because I'll give you something. Public relations experts and strategists have to find the answer. If we are, as Lord Chadwick said, we're in the boardroom and we're asked a question, we have to get the answer. And not necessarily we have to do what, what, what is required because it's out of maybe our scope, but we have to find the, the vendor, the partner, the stakeholder, the specialist that can deliver the goods and bring the answer. So this is my, my views on the, on the opening. Of your first question. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mohammed. I'd, I'd actually like to turn that over now to Chris, perhaps, for a view on that. Um, being the only client on this panel, he's going to come in for some punishment, I think. Um, I'm guessing you would characterize yourself as a big pi picture seeker. Um, um, but how difficult is it, perhaps, to maintain that mindset? Um, and how difficult do you see it being over the next decade? Well, I, I think, first of all, thank you to everyone for coming this afternoon. It's always the the graveyard shift, and I know what an effort it is, so I'll try to make this a, an interesting client experience for you. Um, the biggest problem with PR people is they look frightened in the boardroom. As Peter was saying, they're uncomfortable. I've never seen an accountant look frightened, even when they don't know what they're talking about. I've never seen a lawyer apologize for not knowing what's going to be done. One of the earliest learnings I ever had was being in New York, working for a company called Charles Barker, and I just happened to be the guy in the room on the day when uh, a takeover took place on one of our American clients. And so I was in the frame, but I was 26 years old. I had no idea what to do. The lawyer took me out of the room and he said, Chris, 
If you don't ask for $100,000, you'll look cheap. We had never gone for a billing of that nature before. We didn't even know how to charge. That was 25 years ago. So first and foremost, you've got to have the, the, the poise, the thinking and the capability to do that. Um, beyond that, you then rapidly need to have the skills. Clearly, I was the new boy and we very quickly got the Charles Barker financial team in place. But what had I done? I'd got the money there first of all. If you look at how a PR agency comes in and, and, and talks to you, invariably they don't know your business. In 2005, we did an IPO of Inmarsat. It was a very, very successful IPO. We, on the pressure from the bankers, hired one of a short list of five leading financial PR companies from London. Um, three of the presentations were great. One of the presentations was truly awful, and it was actually the number one agency at the time. And we went with another, with the promise that the chief executive would engage and do the, the IPO personally. If I tell you that I'm the only PR guy who has never paid the success bonus to that particular person, you'll realize just how much you have to stand up in the boardroom. He did not turn up for any single meeting all the way through the process. Frankly, I did the IPO communications along with our investor relations in-house guy and along with my media guy. Uh, in, in those particular cases, it was clear that there was no value being added. So we paid their fee, which was a very small 250,000 pounds, and they thought that they should have also had their success fee, which, uh, uh, no kidding, Martin Sorrell would have really appreciated, of another 200,000, and we said no. You've got to be able to understand what the client really needs. And what the client really needs, to Peter's point, is reassurance that he hasn't got some inadequate press officer pretending to be part of the game. And that can be very hard, because when you start off, you never think you're going to make it to the boardroom, unless you've done an MBA or something beforehand. By a process of chance, luck, osmosis, you find yourself in that room. And when you find yourself in that room, you wonder if you really have the skills. And that's where I was so encouraged by Peter's um, emphasis on training and also the concept of being online. I was speaking with the Swiss university outside and, and saying to them, you know, I'd really like a formal qualification to go with my 30 years experience because I was never a journalist. I came into this by chance. I've been fortunate that I'm good at it, but I've been especially fortunate that I've worked for the same American CEO in two different roles over the last 14 years. And why did I do that? Because before that, I took a risk and went to work for a large American multinational in a, a product that I'm not particularly keen on. Uh, for Peter's information, I ran the Youth Shouldn't Smoke campaigns for Philip Morris for <laughs> the best part of four years. I had a budget of $5 million, and uh, Marlborough had a budget of $50 million in my region. Um, and I was forced to think about what does the company want? What's the data? What's the base? You, all of you, need to immerse yourselves in the businesses that you represent or seek to represent if you want to be even approaching the boardroom door. That would be my strongest advice. Thank you, Chris. Pretty, plenty of, um, of food for thought <coughs> in that answer, not least your, uh, your discussion of uh, qualifications. Um, an, an interesting point, and that would, I think, open up another can of worms. Richard, if I could go to you next and ask you, what do you think um, the PR industry perhaps is getting wrong, and what do you think it needs to get right if it's going to start meeting some of the challenges that were laid out by Chris? Uh, Masa al Kair. I hope I pronounced that correctly. <laughs> That's one way of, of beginning my answer. I think one of the, and Peter touched on this in a way, one of the issues that we have to deal with is that public relations has been, still is, English-centric. In other words, the language that we use when we talk about public relations is the English language. And that is a barrier to understanding about what public relations is about in the majority of the world. So it's important for me, I think, in the, as I look forward to the next 10 years, 
And I believe, personally, it's a bit early to talk about public relations being dead. But I don't think it's too early to be thinking about the funeral arrangements. <laughs> because I think that, really, the experience of the last 10 years and the big growth industry in the last 10 years has been in education of public relations people. And what do we have after 10 years? We have people who can't do the job. And as Peter uh, uh, said, you know, what is the solution to this? The solution is to bring people who are educated in other disciplines and teach them public relations. Because if you understand communication, you don't need necessarily to do it, but what you do need to do, what you need is people perhaps to carry that function out. I've been working with a university in the United Kingdom about developing a public relations course within this established university. And the point that I've been making to them is that our industry is going in two directions. One direction is strategic. And the people who are best qualified to take it in a strategic direction are the people that we've been talking about. The people who have skills which are related to particular industry sectors. They know about pharmacy, they know about etc. And in the other direction, you need people, we will still need people, who can organize an event, who can write a, me write a media release at the very uh, bottom of the pile, who can manufacture a brochure, because I think we'll, we will still have brochures. But those two things are distinct. Those two directions are distinct. And there's been, in the last 10 years, there's been a blossom, blossoming of courses in the United Kingdom which are called media relations. It produces people who are unemployable. They know nothing about any of the skills that we, required, we require to take our industry forward. So, at the one level, we need to be producing different type of people. The second level is that in order to do that, and in order for them to be able to operate, not necessarily, not necessarily globally, but to operate and to understand what's happening in a particular environment, they need, we need a new language of public relations. And that language of public relations, I believe, needs to be in the vernacular. And by the vernacular, I mean it, me, it needs to be in Russian. So that people who, are, who understand the Russian psyche will respond to that particular word, uh, or, or to those words. Because as our targeting becomes more sophisticated, and many of you have probably heard of neuromarketing. That's where you can actually examine the brain cells and see how the brain cells respond to stimuli at one level. At another level, data mining of the internet. That's getting into our minds. We used to rely very much on Opinion surveys, well, all of us lie to opinion surveys. But with this increasing sophistication about being able to target individuals, the best way of targeting the individual is if you understand the whole, not, not just the words, but the culture that goes behind us. We talk, or there is a term in, 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 in English, win-win. That's a recent invention, the term win-win in the English language. But, it is, but the concept is not new. In the Arabic language, and I can't give you the exact word, in Arabic there is a word which describes a process of conciliation, of, of consensus building, etc., which comes to a situation where everybody who is involved is happy with the outcome. Win-win. Why should you, as Arabic-speaking people, be using the term win-win? Why can't 
this more sophisticated word, which has 200, 200 2,000 years behind it, why isn't that something? So my, my feeling is that one, we need to have a different type of person. Two, we need to have a person who is culturally uh, aware, and that means that the, the, the education process for um, public relations people needs to be in the vernacular, and there needs to be a vocabulary, a lexicon, if you like, of words, which are not simply translations of English or American words, but really reflect the culture, the language, the society in which public relations is going to be practiced. Thank you, Richard. Um, Ho, I'm going to come to you next, and then I'm going to go up onto the screen um, to do a couple of the survey questions. Um, we we've talked a lot about talent and people here, and I know that in Asia the talent crunch is particularly pronounced. Are there any lessons that you have for us from that part of the world? Even the, the, the future challenges. Well, in terms of coming up with the type of people who are going to carry this industry forward. I think uh, the, it, it is clear that communications demand uh, in our society, not in just the companies or government, uh, will increase. But uh, the other side is we should not assume that the PR professionals will play a major role or larger role with that trend. Uh, as the keynote speaker already uh, mentioned that uh, the management consultants or even bankers uh, do communications consulting. And the PR person uh, might be uh, the lag behind in that trend. For example, uh, one of the key trends in recent years uh, from the management science was storytelling. But does PR uh, took a leadership in that trend? Uh, actually not. Uh, the, the, the key person in storytelling actually not from the PR side. So I think uh, the, the, the demand of the communication will increase. It's clear but it is not clear yet the PL will take the leadership uh, in that uh, the, the increasing demand, uh, things like that. The second one is uh, we are not specialized yet uh, uh, like the degree that the lawyers or the medical doctors, uh, they enjoy to the, in the boardroom. Uh, I think uh, the, the PR persons, uh, especially in Asia Pacific, uh, maybe it's different from the Europe and uh, the US, uh, but we do, you know, uh, like a, the, every, every PR, from healthcare to technology, things like that. But no, uh, moving forward, I think the, the saying that I've done PR for the last 20 years will have less impact. Uh, it will have more impact saying that for the last seven to eight years, uh, I focus on the CSR communication. That will have much more the weight uh, in their career development or the professionalism. So I think the specialization is also one of the key, uh, especially in Asia Pacific, uh, which is a little bit in the early stage in, in, the, in terms of the PR. Thank you, Ho. Um, Chris, do you have, did, was this just what you wanted to say before I got to the... Sorry. Well, just a, just a little observation there. I think um, what you will all experience in your careers is that you have about a decade cycle in everything you're doing. I started off consumer PR if I could get something in tabloid press, if I could engage in that direction, that would be fantastic. I then really wanted to get into city financial PR. So to do that, I had to talk my way around Charles Barker, get people to invite me in onto some of the pitches, learn. Nobody had a structured way in which to get you to where you wanted to go. There came a point in my career when I'd done broadcasting for the best part of eight, nine years, launched a couple of TV stations, dealt with everything. My next option was to go and do another TV station. And at that point, fate intervened. And I was asked by someone, do you know anyone that'll work in tobacco? And, and that, for your careers, is a very interesting turning point because there's a difficult product which some people have very strong attitudes towards. And my reaction was, hmm, well, a headhunter told me that I needed multinational blue chip experience. If I don't do this, will this ever happen again? So for all of your careers, be flexible, be open, have a general plan for where you want to go to, and, and follow it. Because only by building your personal portfolio of skills will you succeed. 
Because if you're not succeeding, it won't matter where PR goes in the next decade because you'll be left behind. Thank you. Uh, before we go to the floor, I would just like to bring up uh, some of the survey questions, if I could. Uh, I'd like to ask everyone to get out their little voting devices. I think all of us up here can vote as well, if you, if you wish. Um, do we have them up? Ah, yes, okay, great. Number one, so do we think the press release is obsolete? And you can see the time running down on the screen. No, okay, right. So the majority of us here, it still, it still seems a pretty, pretty important tool. I don't know if that surprises us on stage. Um, can we move to the next question, please? <laughs> Is the, is the public relations industry evolving quickly enough? <laughs> Do your own. <laughs> I think that's, um, I, I wouldn't say that's an unexpected outcome. Uh, I'd, li I'd like to skip question three and move straight on to question four, um, which is what was the greatest change in public relations in the last 10 years? And we have five options there. of social media. And last but certainly not least, I think the question perhaps that defines this session, what will be the greatest change in PR in the next 10 years? And in fact, it touches on, I, I think, every topic that indeed Lord Chadlington and all of our panelists have discussed here today. Specialization. I think, we've, we've, I think the panel has converted some people, perhaps. Um, I'd like to open it up to the floor now. Do we have some questions? Yes, there's a gentleman right here. Could you please uh, state your name before you ask a question? Yeah, Khalid Al Sfayan from Sabic. Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to take this opportunity to uh, thank all uh, the speakers. Uh, my question uh, uh, is, uh, after a long time uh, in the uh, public relations field, uh, I think the uh, public relations is uh, building in human uh, and the, in, uh, inside the people. But after a long, long, long time, uh, and, uh, I, I find uh, during the two days uh, for the sessions, uh, we start uh, now at, uh, until the square one, to find the really public relation division. I was in the university uh, before 20, 25 years ago. They give us uh, in the book around 25 public relation divisions. Until now, I, I see different experience during the two days from uh, the specialist people. But uh, until now, we didn't find when we'll start uh, the, our roadmap as a strong base for public relations. Uh, when we start to uh, encourage the people to believe about uh, the public relations functions. Because uh, we, uh, certain functions, we have to be uh, there, certain uh, strategic and uh, policies to guide the people 
how they take the 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 road to all the support. Uh, I didn't call it the the service provider as Mr. Lady mentioned it. It's uh, usually when you get the good and the strong uh, public relation, we have to be the partner. Uh, I hope to see after this is a session when can we get uh, the strong uh, pace of the strong public relations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mohammed, actually, I thought maybe I'd put that one to you because I think it seems perhaps most focused on events in this region. Um, thank you for your question, Khalid. I, I think you've said one word, and I'm not going to uh, try to come up with, uh, with, with an answer that uh, uh, just for the sake of coming up. You said one word, it's belief. And I think the first step, the first step for us to do this and say we're creating a robust industry is for the different stakeholders to believe that this is really a powerful tool, as our keynote speaker said. So it's not just the person who's asking for the service, it is also the person who's delivering the service, and it is also another stakeholder that is quite important. It is the regulations and the laws and the etc. So for example, I'm not gonna dwell to it, I know that you're from SABIC, and you're primarily looking at the Saudi market. We don't have even definitions for titles in the labor office or even in the Ministry of, uh, of Information. We are lumped with advertising. You get the license for a uh, public relations consultancy. It says, It means advertising, promotion, and public relations. So how do you expect this industry to thrive? It doesn't, I, I sometimes doubt that it exists as an industry. It exists as a service. So to answer this, to sum it up, believe and do something about it. Thank you, Mohammed. Richard, you, I think you yeah, have a comment to make. I, I, would like, I would like to say that I disagree with uh, this, the outcome of the second last uh, in audience opinion survey that we had. And that was where you were asked, what, is the great, what has happened in the last 10 years? What's happened in the last 10 years is an increase in skepticism about what we do. We have been exposed. And a lot of what we have been doing has been to our discredit. So we're starting from a negative position. And I think the only way we can recover from a negative position <coughs> is by saying we, our responsibility is not simply for the process of getting the press release <coughs> into the media. We're not, we're not, that's not enough anymore. We have to also accept that we have responsibility for the content of what goes into that. And there are increasingly, particularly in the United States, there are public relations companies which are being uh, part of the uh, people who have to defend in court what they've done. What we also, uh, they're not, their responsibility is not simply to say, I put the press release out, that was what Ivy Lee said more than 100 years ago, and I wasn't responsible for the, con the content. But I think we need to go even further. We need to go to the point where we take responsibility for the outcome of our actions. Where, you know, if we put out false information, and people act on that false information, then we bear some responsibility for that. And that comes from standing up to our client and saying, is this right, is this wrong? Now, I've been in a situation where a client has had two consultancies working on an issue, one arguing in this direction, one arguing in that direction, so that they will win. But until we stand up and accept, I think, total responsibility for the things that we do, then we're not going to have any respect. And that increasing skepticism about us, about what we do, will just snowball. It will just snowball. And there's only one way out of it. And that, for me, is to stand up for good practice, to stand up to our clients, and to stand up for uh, in, in, in integrity and uh, honesty, transparency, and all those other words that we bandy around very rarely live up to. Thank you, Richard. Uh, I think we have time for perhaps one or two more questions. There's a, a lady uh, in the middle there. 
Good afternoon. My name is Gunjan, and I'm from Express Money. Uh, my question is to uh, Lord Chadwington. Uh, you mentioned that in the uh, next decade, uh, there has to be a global system of measurement of PR, PR success. Uh, in the absence of that, right now, we are calculating the success of PR on AVE, which I don't think is very scientific or does just justice to what we do. Uh, so in the absence of, of that, what should be the measurement of uh, you know, a, a successful PR campaign? I think we've got, we've, we need another two hours of this one. <laughs> well, I, I think that the reality is that most of the fees that are earned in a public relations campaign in a single geography, it would cost you as much to carry out the research for the success of the campaign as the fees that you received. And I always look upon it as anything which is less than £150,000 a year is something which should be purely judgmental. The client should be able to say, if I'm spending less than £150,000 a year on the public relations activity, I should be able to say whether that is good or bad. As you would about a person that you're employing. I mean, that seems to be perfectly reasonable. Where it gets difficult is where you are in 10 countries at £150,000 a year, or 20 countries. And there we do need to work through some kind of analytic system so that we can show a client pretty clearly what is happening to his reputation, preferably on a daily basis. We have a, the, the system I mentioned, I'll just take two seconds to talk about that. The system that we're working on at the moment is an analytic system which works on a dashboard that comes up on your screen when you open up your computer in the morning and it can link into your iPad and everything else, up it comes. And it shows you what comments have been made about you either on the web or in analog form anywhere in the world. And it indicates the favorability and unfavorability of that comment. And it plots on a daily basis how that body of information is growing over a period of time against certain set characteristics. So if we suppose that one of the things that the, um, that the media think about in the broadest sense of media, online and offline, is that you're untrustworthy, then we look at an untrustworthy valuation and we look at how far we are moving that towards a level of trustworthiness. And it's a daily check uh, on a compound basis. And we have found that really quite effective. Uh, because it means that you can also rewrite, certainly quarterly, we're doing it monthly, but certainly quarterly, the objectives of the public relations campaign. So that's beginning to be both a monitoring system and an evaluation system and a recalibration of the objectives of the PR campaign. And at the moment, give me another 18 months and I think we'll have something pretty sophisticated which will help clients in all regions. There's one thing that I just wanted to add, which is slightly off listening to the debate that has come, uh, been having. I do think that it is wrong for us not to say that the future of public relations globally lies in this region. The future of public relations lies in this region. This is where we as Huntsworth are investing. This is the most important region of the world in the future of public relations. You are the bridge between the old world of the West, particularly Europe. Europe's not going to recover for a decade. Uh, so until we look at Europe, we look at North America, we look at the rise of the Far East, this is the future. This is the gateway. And you guys have really got to step up to it because it will either make or break what happens here over the next 10 years. Could I, could I add just one sure. thing about the measurement? Uh, I, I think that in terms of the measurement, uh, for example, in Korea, around 2005, the former Korean uh, president put a lot of emphasis on the public relations. So at that time, the Korean uh, the, the government department spent a lot of money 
and higher PR agencies uh, uh, doing PR. Uh, at that time, uh, almost all the projects were not involved with the implementation or media relations, but it is purely about the consulting. So from that time, the most uh, the PR agencies started to build their research arms uh, within their firm uh, to provide that, you know, whether the, their project's uh, money, which is, you know, for, from the tax, has been, you know, well spent. So it's like, you know, awareness level of certain policies, things like that. I think we can do that, the measurement model, things like that. But longer term, for the value of the PR, we got to prove the value of the PR not only to, just to the marketing department, but, but to the CFO. So to do that, we have to uh, find the, the way that, uh, you know, how we can measure the ROI. And to do that, I think uh, uh, we have to work together with finance, uh, the scholars, uh, to come up with uh, the proper the ROI mo model. Without that, we will never be in the boardroom uh, uh, in a strategic level. Can, can I just say that that's a very, very uh, interesting point, but it's impossible. It's never going to happen. And we can take as long as we like over it, it's never going to happen. You are never, ever going to strip out of the communications activity, the public relations role, and isolate it from everything else that's going on in the marketplace. No. And unless you can do that, you will never, ever get the ROI return. Please don't waste our time doing it. It is a waste of effort. What we have to do is to, is to analyze the shift of attitude in specific characteristics of our clients and we can show them that as a result of them spending money, we have made the, what was initially an appearance, they were an untrustworthy organization and they're now a trustworthy organization. And that's what we have to do. Looking at return on investment programs is simply going to fail. The difficulty... Sorry, please. Wait. Can, we, have, we have time for, I think, just a couple more comments, perhaps Richard and Chris, and then yeah. I'm afraid I'm going to have to wrap, but everyone's around, and, and we can continue this discussion. It's sad I have to cut it off just when it seems to be getting quite heated. Richard, you wanted what, to say? What, what, this, focus, this focus on trustworthy or untrustworthy is not necessarily the correct way, in my opinion, because you can distrust an organization, you can distrust a country, you can distrust a supplier, but you will still take the goods from that individual. So what you have to do is to decide what it is you're going to measure. And, it, and it, it, in, I know of a very large multinational company who's, who has no interest in the media except for five publications as far as their reputation. It is a big global company. As far as it is concerned, it is those five publications which it wishes to monitor. Not the run of the mill, consumer, etc. Five important. So you have to be selective. I don't believe that in, in, um, in measurement you need to be broad, etc., and measure everything. Because if you're measuring the press, as you just described your, your dashboard, all you're doing is measuring press releases again in no, a no, different no, way. No, 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 no. Or no, no, publication no, no. no you're not. in a different way. It's a juvenile and analog way of looking at the world. It isn't like that. The world has changed. You're talking about five publications as if we were in 1975. No. The reality is we have a world which is now governed. Which company. is now governed. By, I don't care how successful it is. It's wrong. We're sitting in a world in which is a digitally driven world. It's a world in which Twitter is far more important than the Financial Times. That the articles that are written in the Financial Times and the other newspapers are driven by what is happening online. And until we accept that and understand that, we won't understand the relationship between the online marketing and the offline marketing. And we've got to change, guys. To say there are five publications your client is going to get into terrible reputational difficulty. I'm really sorry, but I'm going to have to end the session here. We'll have to continue this discussion offline, as it were. Uh, I think everyone's going to be around, and, and it's, it's a shame we have to cut it off just as it got a little bit interesting there. Um, all that remains for me to do is to thank uh, Lord Chadlington, to thank our distinguished panellists, to invite Sunil John up onto the stage. Please hang around. Uh, Sunil is, is going to, to, uh, to announce the uh, certificates of appreciation. Thank you.
Thank you. Really, th I think uh, you know the, the session was very very interesting, and I'd request uh, Arun to hand over uh, uh, you know the, the little tokens of, uh, of our appreciation to our keynote speaker first, Lord Chadlington from the Hansworth Group. And we will remember, Lord Chadlington, the three things, money, pride, and fun. You bet. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. We'll, next is Mr. Ho Kim from the Lab Edge, South Korea. <laughs> Mohammed Al Ayed from Trax, just behind you, Arun. Chris McLaughlin from Inmarsat. And Richard Linning from, from the IPRA, uh, IPRA president of 2011.